hit share to start with and hopefully people can see. Can we see? Is that good? Excellent. Yes, can see. Love it. You should have a nice dark screen with some big words that say DIY satellites. Groovy. OK, um, let me go and tell you what I'm going to say first uh, before we go anywhere else. Let me hit the timer reset so I know how the hell long I'm doing. Right. What I want to cover is um, five different areas about uh, satellite stuff. I'm not going to assume that anybody knows a great deal in any particular space. So I want to do a bit of satellite background information. So why we have them, uh, what they do, how much they cost. Um, then I want to go through uh, the Amateur Satellite Organization, um, introduce you to that so you know what that, what that is. Um, then a bit about the satellite missions I've been involved in. Um, that's the FunCube series of satellites. Uh, and I'll finish with uh, satellite data on the internet, open data that people can go and experiment with, do research on, etc., which is quite new for the satellite community. It's tended to have been quite a closed, private way of doing things in the past. Um, and then finally, some FOSS stuff, software bits uh, where people can dive in, get involved, um, play with the toys, generally speaking. So those are the areas I want to cover. That's one minute down on the first slide. OK, let's go and do this. That's a bit of a uh, fuzzy cloud around the planet. Uh, please tell me if you can't see that, by the way. Um, what this is, is a snapshot uh, at a particular date and time of all of the objects orbiting the planet that are being tracked. There are more than this, but these are the ones that are more than 10 centimetres across and are being tracked. So there's a big fuzzy cloud of them. You can probably see that nice green ring they're geostationary comm satellites. Um, they're the ones that do your TV and stuff. The rest of them are doing all sorts of things. And you may notice it gets hairier as you get in towards the surface of the planet because there's more stuff in lower orbits. Um, so why on Earth do people do this? Well, uh, three basic reasons. Uh, one of them is Earth observation. So things like the NOAA weather satellites, um, climate monitoring through the European Sentinel program um, and agriculture support, uh, a company called Planet Labs, take a high resolution imaging um, set of images every single day of the whole planet um, and you can purchase those from them and you can do um, differential earth science on it so you can see where bits are drying out, where volcanoes have gone off, all sorts of things. Um, that's earth observation. Um, the other main use uh, for satellites is communication. So probably everyone's heard of Intelsat. There's also Utelsat because the Europeans like to do things themselves. Um, and then the current trend, which is uh, Elon Musk, SpaceX's Starlink communication system, which is currently going up into space. Um, by the way, I should say uh, I've got notes against all these slides and they are on my public website. So you can come and read my notes and they've got lots of URLs in there. I'm not gonna read anything out of the URLs in. <laughs> Uh, but please come and look at the notes afterwards. Um, the final reason for having satellites up there, up there above the planet uh, is navigation. So this is a system generally known as GNSS, Global Navigation Satellite System. There are currently four different sets of, G of GNSS platforms. There's the original GPS from the United States. There's the Global Navigation Satellite System with a slightly different acronym from the Russians. There's the Baidu navigation satellite system from the Chinese, and then there's Galileo being done by the Europeans because they like to do their own thing. So that's kind of why those things are up there. That kind of doesn't feel like amateur stuff yet, but we'll see. So a little bit about background again, history of things, um, what's, what's gone up there, how big are they, how heavy were they, what did they do? So I've chosen three examples. These are kind of at random. They're spaced at sort of 25, 30 year intervals. Uh, the very first thing is Sputnik 1. Um, if you're interested, it was a 58 centimetre sphere. It weighed 83 kilograms. Most of that was battery. It sent down a one watt radio beacon and it went into low Earth orbit. It's actually not a spherical orbit or it didn't go around in a nice circle. It was quite stretched and it came up much closer one side and then further out again. Well, I didn't know, I only learned this last week looking this up. Sputnik 1 was pressurized with nitrogen into atmospheric pressure. And that's because the valves that were in there, no transistors, they were valves. If you put them in a vacuum, they explode. So they had to put valve, they had to pressurize the sphere. 
Okay, in 1981, Intelsat 5, the fifth generation of the Intelsat comms satellites, um, just to give you an example of how much things moved on in 25 years, is nearly two tons. It's uh, a meter and a half by meter and a half by two meter box. It's got 15 meter wide solar panels and it's shoving out nearly two kilowatts into 25 different transmitters on all those dishes. Um, so things went on quite a lot in 25 years. Come forward another 30 years and you've got a monster like KASAT. So this is about the biggest thing I've found that's currently in orbit that's a satellite per se. It isn't a spaceship with humans in. Um, or the ISS, that's special. Um, KASAT is uh, a largely data focused um, satellite. So it's largely doing broadband comms. Um, it's a two and a half metre by two and a half metre by five and a half metre long box. I don't know if you can see on the picture, there are people up a ladder on the left hand side, just to give you an idea of how big it is. Come and look at the slides and look at the view the image later if you want to see that in more detail. That weighs six tonnes. The solar panels are 45 metres out and it's producing 16 kilowatts, 80 plus transmitters and is handling 90 gigabits a second of comms data and that one's in geostationary orbit so that's 35,000 kilometers away from us so that's the kind of thing that we've had on that basis it doesn't look like something you can do as an amateur does it well a little while ago just before 2000 around 1998 uh, the Centre National d'Etudes Spatiales the lovely people in France um, decided that they were going to have a problem recruiting space engineers if no one could come and play with the toys so they started an education program and they started producing um, components and satellites you can make but without having to do everything yourself from scratch and that was the Myriad program and that's the an image that you've got on the left there um, that's a box, it's 60 centimetres uh, cube, sticks up a bit further than it goes out sideways. Um, it's got 180 watts of solar panel around the side and you bolt whatever payload you're interested in running on top of it. Um, but they mostly used it for education uh, and research for a variety of uh, low Earth orbit experiments. So that was the French in 1998. 2005, the European, European Space Agency launched the very first student only built satellite, which is um, SETI Express. That's a picture of the second left there one. Um, sadly, it didn't work for very long, about three days and the batteries ran out because the power supply failed. Um, I won't tell you who made it. You can look it all up yourself, but yeah. Sometimes letting students build everything is not the right solution. Um, but that's a that's a research and education program from the ESA. That's actually still going, that, that, that education program. Right after the uh, Myriad program started, um, American universities got involved and a couple of guys at Brown University decided that there ought to be a standard for something much smaller. And they came up with this called the CubeSat standard in 1999. It was published, there's been a couple of revisions since then, but basically it's a, um, it's a 10 centimeter cube. So you can hold it in hand, it's kind of this big. They are, they are cute and very small. Um, they're up to about a kilogram in weight, and that's called a single U. So, you, and then they're modular, so you can have a two U or a three U one. Um, the point about it being a standard is it fits in a known launcher, so no one has to be involved in your launch um, arrangements in any significant detail. You just go, "Hey, I want to launch a three U CubeSat, and it weighs two point eight kilos." And a lot of launch companies can now go, "Oh yeah, great, we can do that for this much money." So it makes it a bit more commodity. And this gives you opportunity to get involved um, as uh, organizations, as non-governmental um, things with, that, with less money, or even as individuals. And that's what CubeSats are about. There's a reduced size version of the CubeSat because there's a bunch of people at Moorhead University who decided that the CubeSat was still too big and produced the Pocket Cube, which is half the size, so it's five centimeters by five centimeters, um, it, up to 250 grams um that's a bit more recent 2009 so that's a getting smaller and standardizing approach to space which is allowing more people to be in what does it cost okay ka sat i looked it up they published their figures about 350 million all in to build it to launch it and to operate it for its expected lifetime that's probably out of the range of a lot of organizations and uh, uh, pretty much every individual. Um, Funcube One, which is the one I was involved in, 
cost us around 100,000 to design, develop and build multiple versions of it. So we could keep one on the ground, we could launch one, we could develop against a few, um, we could break a few. Um, and it cost about another 100,000 to launch to, as launch costs. So that's the sort of cost of a, of a CubeSat, which is considerably less and very, as you can see, much more affordable. You go down to a pocket cube, um, that one on the right there is the $50 sat. Um, it actually cost $250, but that's because they built more than one of them. The actual parts for one of them cost 50 bucks. Um, we don't know what their launch costs were because they went into a ride share with another university project um, and no one's actually published any figures on that. It's a little bit difficult to get launch costs out of people. So it's getting cheaper but they're, and they're getting smaller and it's kind of getting easier to do. All of these now are being built um, with off the shelf parts so that we're not talking fancy silicon on sapphire chips that cost tens of thousands of pounds to make each. We're talking buy stuff from radio spares, shove it in a satellite and launch it. Okay, talk about AMSAT for a little bit. Um, there's a nice collection of logos. I just picked the pretty ones. Um, as you can see, there's a theme to them. AMSAT was initially started in, uh, in the US uh, as a umbrella organization to coordinate funding, um, global radio activity uh, as a central meeting place for national bodies and deals with things like licensing and insurance um, on a global basis uh, for amateur radio satellites. So it's amateur radio, ham, ham enthusiasts, I'm one of those, um, and we want to play with space stuff. So that's why AMSAT exists. It's been around since the late 70s. It has some interesting properties because of the uh, quantity of uh, radio enthusiasts that are part of AMSAT. Um, we've got a global receiver network. There's probably more aerials than any government body, even NASA has got. And we tend to be first to receive new signals, which is interesting. Um, so we've been asked to help on uh, several pro professional missions more than once. Um, one of the focuses of AMSAT is to allow uh, amateur radio people to play with stuff in space generally so they will ask uh, or coordinate work on producing what's called transponders so a receiver and a transmitter on the satellite to allow uh, radio amateurs around the world to use the satellite in different ways so either for um, as a direct relay to talk to somebody a long way away um, or perhaps as a an, an engine for testing a new protocol or something like that so there's experimental work going on in that space um, and AMSAT coordinates some of that as well. Finally, there's an educational outreach aspect to it. Um, this is why I'm here doing this and why Sam picked on me to come and talk to you. Um, and that's because uh, AMSAT generally is full up with people who are keen on STEM things. Um, and I've got a lot of interesting contacts in uh, professional space organizations and in schools. Um, there's lots of parents and governors involved as well. So it's a good starting point for getting uh, younger people interested in technology. Uh, generally, as soon as you start talking about space, eyes light up a little bit. Um, and then you say, but it's just electronics, but you can't get to it. And they're less excited. <laughs> but um, it's a good starting point. Uh, it gets us opportunities to lower barriers to entry for all of these things. So that's AMSAT. Cover a little bit now about um, FunCube missions. So there's been six of them. Um, and they don't all work. Some of them didn't work to start with. Some of them have now failed. Um, that's life in launching satellites. They're all very different. Um, I started my involvement in this back in 2009. Um, the series of FunCube satellites that have been launched or variations on FunCube have been launched up until 2018 was the last one. Um, I've just got some representative uh, images acro across here. So FunCube 1, which was the first one launched, uh, went up in 2013. Development work started in 2009. And that was a result of um, a legacy left to AMSAT UK to launch a satellite, please, or at least help fund it. Um, so a team was put together. Um, I was recruited randomly by a colleague who happened to be already involved in the SETI Express programme. So there were people that had come from past experience had picked on others and said, hey, do you want to come and help? So there's a little bit of outreach going on uh, and that felt like a really good thing to do. And we want to do more of that in the future. So I'll get back to that. OK. Um, it's as homebrew. Funky One is as homebrew as we can make it, as I said before. Um, 
with SETI Express, they let the students build all of it and it didn't actually work very well. Um, we chose to build the bits we had the skills and time to do as amateur radio enthusiasts for Funky One. Um, so in particular, um, we built the radios, we built the power amplifiers, we uh, designed some of the sensors and we did all those compute and software parts that are on there. We also did the receiver parts that stay on the ground, which is the picture in the middle. So there's a radio receiver built into a USB dongle um, and that's all done by uh, radio amateurs on their own time. We then bought the mechanical frame for the satellite, um, the solar panels, because you can't make those, um, the power supply and the batteries we purchased as well, because we wanted something that had been to space before, so it had been qualified, um, and the antenna and its deployment systems we also purchased, because again, mechanical engineering stuff that we didn't really have the prior experience, we didn't trust ourselves to get right. Um, but a lot of Funky One was was developed by amateurs um, in their own time uh, and has been very successful. It's still operational after seven years, eight years. Here we go. Okay, um, there were some novel features about FunCube uh, that we did at the time, 11 years ago, uh, which were, hadn't been done before. Um, there are more people have done them now. Um, well, I just, I just want to go through a couple of those things. So uh, we had a store and forward messaging system on the satellite. So you could chuck a 200 byte block of data up to the satellite and it would be broadcast to everybody. Uh, we called them fitter messages because it was some terrible pun on Twitter. Um, we were trying to get, come up with a better name, but nobody ever did. Um, so those are available. There's a set of nine of those that we can program in and, and deliver continuously. Uh, and there's another 30 odd that we can have in, uh, in store and, and cycle them around. It's an experimental satellite, largely for educational purposes. And one of the really useful bits about education is to look at what happens over the course of an orbit. So in the process of going all the way around, we record um, telemetry data, temperatures, um, sunlight, radio signal strength, all of that stuff, uh, package it all up. And then every two minutes, we send that back down to the ground. So a school with the receiver equipment can pick up all of the necessary telemetry they need for the rest of the day's science lesson, or possibly even for a week. Uh, in one pass. So a satellite goes overhead once, they get all the data they want. So whole orbit data that we stored on board. We designed and built a turnkey solution for educational uh, uh, reception. So rather than leave people to their own devices, which tended to be the way um, amateur stuff was done in the past, we designed and built the receiver device, which is the picture in the middle, which turned out to be very well, very well received. Um, and surprisingly lucrative. Uh, the team that built that are actually um, happily retired on the proceeds of selling them now. Um, we also then wrote all the software to do the telemetry decoding and display off the back of that. So we could ship a turnkey solution um, to educational organized establishments. The last novelty uh, item that we included was a centralized data warehouse. And again, this sounds like something that would be obvious now, but no one had done it before. We collected all of the data from all of the receivers around the world through our dashboard software and pushed it all into a common store and a website, uh, which meant people could come along and look at a much more consistent package of data and then perform large big data science effectively on that. Uh, and we've learned some really interesting things about how uh, satellite spin rates change over periods of years. Um, so that's been interesting to do. Uh, where was I going to go? Oh yeah, so uh, a few launch details. I said it launched in 2013 in November. It's still operational. Uh, the success of that first mission resulted in uh, educational links with various places around the world. Um, and we were asked to come and help two universities in the uh, Emirates, Emir United Arab Emirates and Jordan, um, who wanted their own students to be taught how to do this. Um, so we were asked to come over and, and, and help educate their students and get them built and launched as well. So there are two other fun cubes up there now called uh, Naif One and JY One Sat, which are the UAE and Jordan respectively, and they're both still largely operational. Although JY One Sat had a bit of a, an issue about two weeks ago, we're still trying to work out what's happened. Um, we've also got a ham radio fun cube in inverted commas, but it's the, it's the same protocols and telemetry system but it's on a completely different satellite and that's on the ESAO mission which is a much larger European Space Agency one so that's one of the ESA's um, educational framework missions uh, we've got a, we've got a set of, of, of radio boards on there as well 
Each mission as we went along, um, we added some extra features to the satellites. So for instance, for Naive One, we put uh, stabilization on. FunCube One has got what they, what they politely term passive magnetic attitude stabilization. It's a bar magnet down the middle. So it at least keeps it in line with the Earth's magnetic field and then it spins around the magnet. The Naive One launch, we put a, dyna a dynamic and active stabilizer in um, called a Magnetorker, which has got coils that react against the Earth's magnetic field um, and try and stabilize the satellite. That was the first time that piece of technology had been launched at that scale. Um, so that was an experiment we were running with the company that had designed and built that piece of equipment. For JY1SAT, we also managed to up the transmitter power quite a lot um, and we could then support image transmission st still images, which were uploaded to the satellite. We haven't actually got cameras on board, but we were working towards that ability. Finally, there's a receiver at the British Antarctic Survey Station in Antarctica. Um, that's kind of fun. One of, our, one of the comms engineers there is a radio, radio ham and said, hey, I can take one of these with me if you can make it small enough. So we redid all the software to run on, fun, on a, um, a Raspberry Pi with a FunCube dongle attached to it. Um, and that's happily receiving a lot of telemetry because a lot of low Earth orbit satellites are what they call polar. So they'll go over the poles as the Earth goes around underneath. So if you've got receiving station at one of the poles, you see a lot more satellites. So that's been interesting to run. Um, and we have eventually open sourced all of the software that we did. There were licensing issues to begin with. So there we go. That's FunCubes 1 to 6. We are looking at what we're going to do next. Uh, this started, ooh, middle of last year as a conversation within the team. Um, I've got more details to come on this, but at the moment uh, I'm just showing you the one picture that we have drawn, <laughs> which is a, uh, an architecture diagram for how the onboard compute should work. I don't want to take you through that in any horrific detail, don't worry. <laughs> um, what I wanted to cover was some of the uh, some of the decisions we made about what FunCube next should and shouldn't be. And what was important to us that we had a more open and inclusive development process. Um, we were worried that diversity wasn't very good in the team. Um, we weren't necessarily getting the expertise, skills and enthusiasm that we needed to, to make good progress. Um, we also discovered that the uh, CubeSat standard, which started off as a mechanical standard and has developed a little bit to an electrical connector standard, but hasn't really gone much further, would benefit greatly from having internal standardization on things like uh, APIs. So we're hoping to move towards that and, and, and drive those standards forward. The big decision that we made with FunCube Next was to not try and launch a completed closed system. All the previous FunCubes, we had lots of discussion beforehand about what it should and shouldn't do, and then went away and built it, and then shipped it. And that's very waterfall. Um, and that's typically how anything that goes into space gets done because the timescales are huge. But it's not very good for diversity and inclusion. You're not giving people an option to be part of that. So we thought it might be fun to fly an open platform in space, not a closed system. There are challenges in that in getting it licensed and insured to launch because you've got to demonstrate your software is safe. Um, so we have to have ways around that, which we think we can do. Um, it does mean that we can get our platform designed and built with a known scope. So we think we can actually get the thing in space reasonably short period of time. Um, and then we can offer all those lovely APIs and uncommitted microprocessors for people to fly their own code. Uh, and quite how we want to do that and what the enthusiasm will be and how many people want to be involved. We don't know yet. Um, we're first people to ever try this. So we're going to experiment and find out how many people would like to write code to run on a microcontroller on a satellite. And that might be you. Uh, we're not alone in doing this. There was one other team came and contacted us after we published this mission at the, um, at the AMSAT colloquium last year, uh, a team called Space Team. And if you've ever played Space Team on your phone, you will know those are the kind of that's the kind of enthusiasm we like. Um, so there's Space Team SAT. There's a bunch of Aust Austrian educators who are particularly focusing on uh, early high school students. Um, so they're looking at doing a Python based platform. They're going to constrain people's choices a little bit in what they can run. We've been looking at a more open platform that doesn't commit to any particular language or technology in that space. But you will say, hey, here's a here's, here's an STM32 microprocessor. Run what you like on it. Um, or here's a risk v core run what you like on it so but so they're compatible products products projects um and when we're working with them now to make sure we don't do anything completely um, incompatible between them okay uh how are we doing for time 24 minutes all right um 
yeah i'm not gonna say any more about the diagram if i start talking about the diagram i'll be another 20 minutes and i won't have gone anywhere so <laughs> let's move on um internet data stuff things that are available to people uh, on the internet as open data stores that you can come and play with um right after uh, we did our warehouse uh, and published that we were going to do that and in 2013 it went live for Funcube data collection uh, a project was started called satnogs um who are probably influenced a little bit by what we've done um, but decided that they had a different focus and a different challenge uh, and satnogs is a open project to build a receiver ground station uh, not a transmitter or a control mechanism just to receive a ground station to get as much satellite telemetry data down from around the planet as we can um, which is a good aim and well they keep things that are uh, known satellites but they also collect non-decodable signals so if you hear something odd chances are um, satnogs will have a recording of that somewhere that you can go and do analysis on that's that's where a lot of uh, uh, fun research takes place uh, with the satellites or space ships that uh, that don't have published uh, technology or in radio protocols things like spacex and the chinese missions for example are not very open about what how they do things doesn't mean we can't reverse engineer it um, so satnogs is part of that process uh, they've got a set of parts that you can buy to build a ground station so again looking at the sort of thing we did with uh, the turnkey solution for education satnogs are trying to put together a buy this list of parts bolt it together stick it in your garden and you can listen to satellites that's what they're after it's all built around uh, raspberry pis and arduinos uh, most of their codes in python so it's really nice and accessible uh, it's a really good place to go go and have a look and see how this stuff is done. Um, so that's Satnox. There is the Funcube warehouse. I have to mention this, of course. Um, that's a screenshot of it as it was about two weeks ago, um, looking at JY1SAT, which was the last one that went up. Um, this is our central warehouse of data that we've collected. Um, all the received telemetry from launch day onwards is available for download in CSV, I think we do or possibly something more, more efficient. <laughs> um, because we are receiving data from lots of individuals running the dashboard software, um, they need to provide an identifier for who they are when they upload it, um, and we run a league table. So it's a little bit, it's a bit of encouragement for people to come and stay involved and leave their receivers switched on so that we get all the telemetry that we want. Um, and there's, a, as you can see on the left there, last data was provided by WB0IZO. Um, yeah. And there are league tables about who's transmitted the most packets in the stuff. That's kind of fun. Um, it got quite heated at the beginning. I think people have calmed down a bit now. Uh, long term analysis, I mentioned people have been doing a lot of that sort of looking at what's learnable over long periods of time because we've got a lot of data going back uh, eight years. Um, it also makes a really useful educational resource prior to trying to do stuff in real time. You can spend a while with your students looking at historical data, getting questions answered, um, setting expectations of what's going to happen when the satellite really goes overhead. Um, I haven't got it on the screenshot here, but there's also pictures on here as well. We, it's got a graphing capability so you can draw nice graphs um, of telemetry values over time. And then people can try and reproduce that in real time from from the satellite as it goes overhead. So that kind of stuff is uh, is all good fun for educational purposes. Um, last one I think I want to mention here is uh, TLEs or two line elements. This is a geometry um, set of values for an, an orbit. So it's only an orbit around the earth. It doesn't represent an orbit uh, anywhere in the rest of, this, uh, of the universe. Um, but TLEs are a reasonably efficient way of having a set of, I think it's about six numbers that explain uh, what an orbit, an orbiting body is actually doing, exactly what vectors it's, um, it's following. Uh, and that allows you to predict position. Uh, the screenshot I've got is a piece of software called gpredict, which is very popular, um, written by a friend of mine, Alex. Um, and that shows you for each satellite that you're interested in, and there's a big filter for you know, several thousand, you can pick on them. Um, it shows you where you can see them from on the ground. So this is what's known as a footprint. So the circle, the sort of circles you see there are where that satellite's visible on the ground. Um, if you imagine you've got your curved surface and your point above it, there's a, a tangent where it touches the curved surface and past that point, you, it's below the horizon. So that's what it's showing you on this diagram. 
and it also shows you time of flight. Um, it does a prediction about when you should be able to see it from where you are. Because this is my G predict, it says Felix Doe on there in a little blue dot. Um, so I can ask this to say, when's the next satellite coming up so I can prepare my radio and try and get some telemetry back. There we go. Um, but that TLE data is available in the open from NORAD and Cellus Track, And is, you can do interesting um, calculations based on it. One of, the, one of the more important things to do is to work out if two things are going to, or more than two, might hit each other. So there's collision detection, and that's actually a really hard problem because there's some uncertainty in the positions and they're going really, really quick, like 17,000 miles an hour. Um, so it's a bit tricky sometimes to work out if things are gonna come near each other or not. Uh, so there's still ongoing research in that space as to doing better collision prediction based on TLE data. I lied, it's not the last one. <laughs> um, this is a more recent project called Polaris um, that I came across earlier this year and I've, um, borrowed some of the information actually from the nice chat that presented about this Roger Brown. Um, this is a machine learning experiment. So they're saying, hey, we've got all this data now. We've got data from satellites individually, but we've also got collections of data across satellites from something like SatNox. Um, so can we learn anything from that corpus of information? So Polaris is a discovery program um, and they do pretty 3D graphs. Um, and show they do discovery of relationships so it's clustering at the moment they're clustering things of different telemetry values that come down from from the craft in space and seeing if there's unexpected relationships between them you might discover that every time your transmitter uses this modulation mode your battery has a has a problem or your power supply registers a fault it wasn't anything you expected and no one was looking for it so you didn't see it but this kind of analysis can find it plus the multi-satellite analysis so you might have things like sun sensor values uh, and see a little dip in the, in the illumination level across a series of satellites along a path that may have been a meteorite coming between them and the sun and you can follow it and that kind of thing is fun um, so that's polaris that's a that's a large data experiment right fast things um, in addition to the stuff I've just mentioned, uh, all of which are open source as well, um, these are um, widely there. Yeah, these are other things. <laughs> GR Satellites is a, a GNU radio extension. I don't know if you've met GNU radio. It's an open source software defined radio uh, system. It's been around for many years. And a gentleman called Daniel Estevez looks after a series of decoders for satellite data. So um, the GNU radio part is used to do all the basic radio reception, and then you get a stream of bits out and you need to know what they mean. That's where GR Satellites comes in. Um, that's there to uh, decode as many things as possible. Um, Danny started this back in 2015. In six years, I think they now support nearly a thousand satellites, uh, which is a minor miracle. And it's a go-to source for reference decoders for a lot of the um, satellites that are out there, including ones that have been reverse engineered. Um, in the middle is a decoder for the American AMSAT Fox series of FOXSAT series of satellites. Um, this is open source Java. Um, as it happens, they borrowed our um, decoder. Uh, I had a nice email from the guys writing this saying, hey, can I steal your code and put it in ours? Yeah, of course you can. Um, that's, uh, that's for decoding the telemetry from their satellites that's similar to ours. Um, the FunCube decoder as well, uh, that's down in Antarctica running on a Raspberry Pi, that's all in open source on GitHub as well. So you can go and look at some of the lower level details or even get involved in improving how those work. Um, on the right hand side is a slightly dubious looking website name and it's intended to be, um, this tends to be the focus of people who are doing reverse engineering of satellites. So they're looking at what's up there that we don't know about, but we can see the signals. And they've had some significant success um, entertainingly. They be able to de they were able to decode SpaceX's video feeds um, and see things that, that SpaceX didn't put on the YouTube broadcasts, uh, like what the LOX tank looked like inside and, and longer views of the of the orbits and stuff. They've also been working on decoding the Chinese missions, like Chang'e 5 and Tianwen 1, that this week landed on Mars. Um, they've got somewhere in decoding that stuff. So this is a bunch of people who signals analysis is their their thing um, and they spend their time doing that and document it here 
And what tends to happen once they've got a documented decoder here is it ends up in GR satellites. But those are fun things to go and have a look at. They're good starting points for ways into this as, a, as an open source hobby. Uh, yeah, the root guys are currently looking at Rocket Lab, SpaceX's Starship uh, and other Mars missions as well. And they, a lot of the time they'll work on recordings which have been kept in Satnox. So all these things are related. It's all good fun. Okay, um, that is all I want to say at the minute, 6.42, so I'm going to pack it up there. Um, that's me. Those are my call signs. Um, that's what I used to do. <laughs> I'm now happily retired. Um, some contact details at the bottom. And as I said before, all my slides are available on my website. Um, I'll get Sam to send that out later if you want, because um, I've just remembered I haven't put it here anywhere, which is unhelpful. Um, there we are. Um, Thank you very much. Right, we have done. got question abby do you want to just un mic and ask the question i'll take that as a no i'm assuming that means maybe but... yeah no, no hey. it's fine sorry <laughs> <laughs> i was i was to be fair i was multitasking and i was trying to find where zoom was um well mine's a bit of a random one super no, interesting fine. thank you very much but but uh, space junk is a bit of a Aha. A bit of a burning problem in space at the moment, right? So, I, so I'm just interested about we've got all these like nuts and bolts and other things that are flying up there. What's being done around managing <laughs> like so these so these satellites like further impact it? Yeah, so it's been of increasing concern in the professional community um, and the amateur community for a while. Um, there's a massive ramp yeah. up in launch rates at the moment of stuff that's going up there. Um, there are missions dedicated to working out how to deal with themselves or other things. So there's things, uh, there's light sail, uh, which was a, a big sail deal between thing. There's, um, what was it? I'm trying to think what they all are now. Sorry, I should know these off the top of my head, but I don't. Um, there, are, there are research missions actually being done by the University of Surrey. Surrey Satellite Technology are looking at a, a deal bit mechanisms for individual satellites. Um, I know that NASA are looking at a robotic uh, deorbiting technology where they literally go up and grab one and chuck it in um, or chuck it out, one of the two. Um, so there's robot arm based stuff and the Japanese are involved in that as well. Uh, yeah, probably worth mentioning, um, if you look at that lovely picture, the stuff that's all the red dots and the green ring, they will stay there forever because they are not subject to any atmospheric drag. Um, so it's thousands and thousands of years before that orbit changes. All the stuff down in the atmosphere or in any, any, any sort of atmosphere, so up to about 200 kilometers above the surface, um, or and more than that, up to about 500 kilometers above the surface, things will very slowly drag and deorbit themselves and go in. Um, Funky One, when we launched it, was uh, had a mission prediction between three and five years. And we thought after, a, three to five years we think the battery will be dead and we were guaranteeing uh, we were guaranteed by the launch provider that after 15 years it would have um, decayed and, and, and burned up so that's where we are at the moment there's a bunch of research going on it is a concern it's being uh, it's being dealt with at fairly senior levels um, governmental coordination internationally is tricky does that help i think that I assume so. Yeah, right? yeah no, that's all good. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm just interested. So thank you very mm. much. Yes. MT, do you want to speak? Someone has oh. a hand up. Because <laughs> he never wants to tell me who it is. I know who you are. Um, right, this is from MT, uh, which is what kind of bandwidth you will have communicating with satellite? Oh, good question. Okay, I didn't mention stuff about bandwidths. Um, it varies depending on the comms frequency that you're using. Uh, the ones we've done have been fairly low frequency, so they're in the UHF or VHF band, so same as FM radio or TV, um, under, under a gigahertz, and at that point we're fairly limited. The actual available bandwidth we're allowed to use is a couple of hundred kilohertz, so that's all we can do. Um, at the moment, FunCube 1 has an uplink of five board, our control link going up to it is five bits a second, and our data link down is 1200. Um, ISAO is 9K6 both ways. 
There you go. I don't know if there's any other questions. Anyone else? Yeah, please. Paul, Paul, Paul Skiro here. Um, what what telemetry format do you use? What data format do you use? Is it CSV oh, or JSON or binary? Or from <laughs> there, are actually, or? there are actually standards, and I didn't want to dig into all of that, but yeah, there are standards that people like NASA use that uh, where they've got bits to spare. When you're doing something down at 1200 bits a second, we actually did our own because we wanted every bit to count. Um, um, but we publish those. We, we, we're obliged to. We're not allowed to do encrypted downlinks. They're allowed to be. They should be published um, according to international regulations for amateur use. Um, so there are some proprietary ones. Again, uh, GR satellites is a great place to look and see how ugly that can get. <laughs> and do, does anybody encrypt the data? Does SpaceX or NASA encrypt any data? Or is it all interestingly, in interestingly, no. Not until you start publishing reverse engineered protocol decoders, and then they change their mind. <laughs> Very good. Right, we've got another message here from MT. What kind of equipment is required to start listening satellite? <laughs> okay, uh, I could yeah, I could show you a picture of the aerial in my loft if you like, but it's probably a bit personal. Um, not a lot uh, for this type of stuff, for the amateur band stuff, uh, and for things that. Uh, yeah, so ten gigahertz stuff is typically the same as satellite TV. So you're looking at the same kind of gear. So you can actually use satellite TV dishes for those. Um, they're a bit tricky to point at the right satellite though, because they're very focused. Um, for VHF and UHF, where you're talking two meter wavelengths, things like this big, then ordinary looks like a TV aerial, a Yagi that you just point at the sky, handheld, works fine. Um, in terms of radio gear, uh, pretty much there's a, a dozen available USB radios that just plug in the side of a, of a PC and you're off the rest of its software. Next question from Jason. Are there any satellites where the public can upload their own applications? Not yet. Pumpkin next. First one, if we get there, um, maybe Space Team Sat because they've limited their scope and might get there first. There you go. Fantastic. We'll try and have another event then. <laughs> Actively local. Oh, well, this is mildly recruiting for people who are interested in doing that. So please do, um, please do get in touch. What, what level of dot for shift are you getting? Ah, oh, good question. Fly across the sky. Good question. So at our current downlink frequency of 144 megahertz, it's about five kilohertz uh, end to end, uh, with the majority of the shift occurring in the 10 seconds it goes overhead. Big S-shaped curve. Two and a half kilohertz either way. Uh, the other, the follow-up to that was, if your uplink rate is five bits a second, yes, and I'm assuming there's lots of error pr protection and detection on that, so you don't send it duff messages. What sort of messages are you uplinking? And how long okay. does it take so to get there? It is, it is command and control only. Um, absolutely no software patching. One of the things we decided early on with Fun Cubes, uh, where we're not going to attempt patching code in space. Yeah, NASA do it. They've got much bigger radios, and huge transmitter dishes, and much higher bandwidth. We can't do that. So, um, yeah, we've got command and control messages only. So it's like turn this on, turn that off, or here's a new here's a new fitter message is the biggest thing. Two hundred bytes is the biggest thing we do. Okay. So Sam says but, yes. Sorry, a new fitter was that? I'm sorry. Yeah. So a new a new store and forward message is the biggest thing we we, we ah, transfer right. at the moment, and that takes cool. it takes a couple of minutes at five port. <laughs> Sam, Phil, Sam would like to, I, I assume you guys know, know each other anyway. Yes. Sam would like, to known, would like to be alerted when there is a chance to upload uh, your own applications. I'm sure they would. Yes. Uh, tell you what, Sam, should we do this via this, this channel, this community? Um, because yeah, uh, there will be an announcement. And what I'm hoping is that there's a GitHub where people will come and chuck issues in and say, hey, really keen to do this or have this idea. Uh, we're hoping to do it like that. To be honest, as well, we've got. Um, I work um, at Suffolk College, and we have a project called Stemtastic. So again, if there's, you know, there's loads of um, they get the kind of BBC journalists as well. So there's more than one portal that we can push this information out through. Through to so yeah. So you're, you're an ideal point for this. That's why we're doing it. Basically, I'm just a nosy old cow, so that's the yeah, end. Speaks to everybody, so yeah. I, 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 it took me to fifty to find my purpose in life, but here we go. Um, Henry says, it, "What average latency between the receiver and the satellite?" Oh, okay. This is a great. Yeah, people assume space long way away. Actually, in low Earth orbit, it's milliseconds. You're only doing uh, three, four hundred, five hundred kilometers straight up, or off to the sides a bit longer, but. 
it's it's less than a thousand kilometers usually so that's milliseconds um which is why starlink actually works so well because they're in low and medium orbits fantastic i think actually, i think i misunderstood sam's yes sam would like to ask a question sam yes I would. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm happy to help anyway yeah, um, <laughs> what, one of the questions i've got you said you were looking for more diversity you're looking for new people to come in yes I mean, what skills do you need is it just imagination or yep <laughs> Enthusiasm. Um, the, what, what, the, I've got another whole talk about FunCube next, which I did at the colloquium last year. Um, <laughs> this is where Miss Parnell says, "Oh, come on then, do yeah, that one as well." Well, that one's a bit that one's a bit deeper and technical about one particular thing. But um, yeah, we are wanting to start with a what would you, as an experimenter, want to see in a satellite API? We want to start from an API-led point of view of building the platform underneath it. Um, and empowering people to build experiments on top. So that's where we want to start. And yes, it's documentation first. <laughs> We've got one other question from MT. Um, some time ago, I read paper on blockchain in space. How feasible is it? OK, um, my first question is why? Doing a certificate authority in space. Here you go. Get to that private key. That's that's kind of makes sense. Blockchain in space because it's all open. Not sure of the value unless you have a wallet in space, maybe. But you ain't going to be mining <laughs> on a satellite. <laughs> no chance. Not unless it's on KASAT. And you need a fat wallet to get there. Yeah. <laughs> it's not going to it's not going to self fund, I don't think. <laughs> Fantastic. Abby says, really interesting. Thanks, Phil. Any other questions from anybody in any way? Put your hand up. Say yes. Ask the question. No, I think that's it. That's a reasonable amount of questions. Right, cool. thank you very much, Phil. Drop the um, share slides, so please, I can see everybody. Yeah, slides. So, Jason, tomorrow, um, Phil's going to will send me the slides and we'll share them. Hi, Sam. Um, and we will share you the slides with you. Just to let you know, as I said, this uh, the the groups are all sort of banded together. So uh, next week we have a talk from Sims, which is the small business education, which is around why Google My Business should be your business. And we recently ran a digital economic development course, <clears throat> and it was one of the most uh, popular talks that was given. And the, the lady who runs it's very good. We've then got two Syncips rich talks, one of which is around video conferencing hacks to make you a great presenter. Um, and we've got another one which is around a, um, a quality first approach to a quality first approach to software development, which is all good. Um, so we'll send you through the details of, of all of those tomorrow. And again, if any of you are interested in speaking, if you want to pitch a, pitch, pitch a talk or if you know anybody else that you want to volunteer, let us know. We'll send you the emails via Meetup tomorrow. Um, we're sticking with Meetup despite everybody else <laughs> leaving it. We know they're a pain in the neck, but uh, they do. They do they, we've been there that long now. We can't leave. Um, and that's kind of it. So um, thank you all very, very much for attending. We really appreciate it. You're getting lots of thank yous, uh, Phil. Quite, quite Sorry. right. We really appreciate it. We can't do this without you. And as I said, there's lots of different stuff going on in Suffolk at the moment and in the East region. So it'd just be great to get everybody around together and we can all be communicating and learning together. So, uh, Phil, you've done a grand job. Lovely. We'll see can you. I, can I just sneak, sneak a quick shout out for the Switch Tech Drink about tomorrow? Again, it's on Meetup. Totally and forgot so, about that. Yes. Uh, yeah. Sorry, so we've got pub events Sorry. every two weeks. So the Ipswich drink about next week, and then the week after is the Thirsty Robot, and then they alternate from then on in. But we will yeah. put both of those links in those emails again. So uh, and yeah. we'll be on the gin. And <laughs> at that point, Phil and will have actual alcohol in his in his glass. Yeah. We are we are now brave, and I am now using the Steamboat Tavern Garden when it's not raining as my mm -hmm. uh, drink about location. So Fantastic. Um, well, you're, those you're, of you who can stomach the idea. Oh, Let I, me know. I, You're welcome to join. Oh, Phil and I have discussed this. We don't think the pub in real life is a good example. The idea is that everyone can get drunk enough that they don't have to stumble home. That's it. That's it. But, You're so, a bit further away. You're all most welcome. So either go to the Steamboat Tavern tomorrow night and meet David, or um, you can join online and we'll send you the link first thing in the morning to uh, come to the pub event. So thank you, everybody, and we'll see you at the next ISTN event. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. See you later. Bye. Thanks, Phil. Bye. Bye.